Hello, and thank you for worshiping with us today on this first Sunday in Lent. And I want to give a special thanks to all those uh, who are helping with today's service. For Sharon, our liturgist, uh, Carol, who's uh, directing the choir and also uh, lending her uh, singing with us during the hymns. Also, Linda, our organist, and Bruce, Wayne, and Jason, our sound system engineers, and Bruce also serving as our, our videographer. So thanks to all of you for, for your help. Lent calls us to a special journey. We are travelers seeking to deepen our relationship with God. Lent calls us to the edges and the borders of our existence. We are disciples gathered to learn more about God. So let us worship the God of love. We will now sing our opening hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
Will you please join me in the gathering prayer? Let us pray. God of all creation, we give thanks for your rainbow promise. As we go the season of Lent, help us to recognize the signs of this promise in all the wilderness places. Amen. Welcome to this online service where no matter who you are, who you are in life's journey, you are welcome to worship. May the peace of Christ be with you. There are some announcements I'd like to share with you. You are invited to a time of fellowship and Bible study on Zoom this Wednesday morning, February 24th at 9.30. We will be discussing Professor Amy Jill Levine's book entitled Entering the Passion of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide to Holy Week. And a few copies of Dr. Levine's books are available at the church. Our scripture readings for today are from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. The first scripture reading is from Genesis. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And from Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11, then Jesus was led by this spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, and that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to, to him, all these I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Here are two questions for you to ponder on this first Sunday in Lent. Who are you? What is your main purpose or goal in life? Now you're free to think about those questions while we explore the amazing story of Jesus' temptations. In our gospel reading for today, we see Jesus fasting and praying for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. In the previous chapter of this gospel, chapter three, Jesus has heard the voice of God saying, this is my son, my beloved on whom my favor rests. 
But it wasn't until Jesus' experience in the wilderness, after 40 days of prayer and fasting, that another voice, not from heaven this time, says to him, if you are the Son of God, and it's a question of identity. Now, identity theft is still in the news. The Internal Revenue Service alerted tax professionals two weeks ago about a dangerous new phishing scam in which a cyber criminal is sending emails claiming to come from the IRS in an effort to electronic filing identification numbers, or eFINs. Professionals are among the main targets of identity thieves who are trying to steal client data and tax preparers' identity so they can file fraudulent tax returns for refunds. In Houston, people are being warned that if they receive a mysterious 1099 form, they may be a victim of identity theft. So identity theft is still a problem in our interconnected world. And identity was a critical issue for Jesus. In the passage, that we just read, we see Jesus fasting and praying for 40 days, 40 nights in the desert. It was a search for identity. Time and again throughout his ministry, Jesus' identity is an He had to ask his disciple the, the first easy question, who do people say that I am? Then he had to ask the second more difficult question that you and I have had to answer. But who do you say? that I am. The disciples would even ask about his identity. Who is this that even the wind and waves obey him? And his enemies would ask, well, who is this that forgives sins? Only God can forgive sins. Many of the people were expecting Messiah that would wave the magician's wand and get them out of trouble. Prove to us who you really are. Are you truly the son of God? Well, after a long season of prayer and fasting, it was natural to expect food. I think one of the greatest understatements in the Bible is that Jesus fasted 40 days and he was hungry. Well, if you are the Messiah, make these stones become bread. Moses gave the people manna and quail and water. Is it too much to ask that these stones be turned into bread? You see, the tempter was clever, always clever. The tempter uses logic, makes everything sound so reasonable. Look here. God led the Hebrews through the sea, through the wilderness, through the hostile armies of Moab and Edom and into the promised land. Why can't you, if you are the Messiah, call on armies to help you now? Remember how James and John expected Jesus to call forth the armies of God when they asked him to bring down thunder and lightning and destroy the evil city? It's all so logical. And Jesus' reply sounds so illogical. Well, the last temptation is the most subtle of all and perhaps the most challenging. The tempter, the opponent, says to Jesus, I will give you all that you see in the world badly enough by refusing to use his power and by using only the word of God to accomplish his purpose. Jesus established his identity. And so this brings us to the core of the problem of identity, and it hits, it hits close to home. Remember Israel? How Israel wanted to be the chosen one, but didn't want to pay the price of costly servanthood? Well, Jesus is tempted to achieve the destination without the trouble of making the journey. He's tempted to reach the goal without making the sacrifices necessary to gain the prize. You know, it's somewhat like wanting the resurrection without first going to the cross. I mean, we, couldn't, we wouldn't have civil rights legislation if people like Martin Luther King Jr. had not made tremendous and ultimate sacrifices. It takes work and sacrifice to accomplish most tasks or goals. And this temptation or test, you see, Jesus' purpose wasn't just to provide daily bread, but the bread of life, to give his own body if need be. Jesus' purpose in his identity was to lose his life that the world might be gained for God. 
Jesus' identity and purpose wasn't to show off by throwing himself off that high wall and letting the angels bear him up. His purpose was to let himself be raised on the cross, thus drawing the whole world to himself. And I have not been able to find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus is anything more or less than a servant. I mean, everywhere he goes, everywhere he ministers in his preaching, teaching, and healing ministry, Jesus acts like and is literally our servant. I mean, do you find Jesus anywhere in the scripture stuck up or proud or haughty? I, I don't. I mean, do you ever find him Lord or anyone else? No. We find him being humble from the beginning when he was born in danger to the end when he was crucified on a cross. It would be out of character to find Jesus acting like a Napoleon or any leader who has forgotten that he or she is the servant of the people and not our rulers. In the same way, it's easy to spot someone who lives the way Jesus lived by how he or she acts in everyday life. I mean, do you remember how Jesus fell on his knees in the upper room, you know, the night before he was betrayed and he washed his disciples' feet? That's a test of how well of faith fulfills his or her identity and carries out his or her destined purpose of being God's love of God and neighbor. You see, Jesus is the human one who is the model of loyalty, of fidelity to God. And he was, he was that humble uh, servant um, par excellence. If our fundamental identity is that of being God's children, then our purpose is to serve God, to worship God, and to love God forever, and to love our neighbor as ourself. In other words, we are to do our best to live the way Jesus did. We are to live out our identity as children of God, to be caretakers of one another and of the earth. But how do, how do we achieve purpose. I mean, we all fall short. So how do we begin to achieve it? Well, we do not achieve it perfectly or once for all. We achieve it by recognizing our shortcomings, guidance, recognizing other people as no better or worse than we are. We achieve it by, by doing our best to love and serve God and others. I mean, there is no surefire formula for success. To us, the church, like to Jesus, the tempter offers such a formula. Make a miracle. In the play Green Pastures, the tempter says, reel back and throw yourself a miracle. The people will come flocking. Put on a good show. The people will come a flocking. And once Jesus did that, or almost did that, he led 5,000 or so people into the country and then took a few fish and some loaves of bread and fed them all. And sure enough, the people wanted then and there to make him king. And we read how when Jesus saw that they would take him and make him king, he disappeared. You see, the temptation is always there to lose our identity and allow ourselves to be made into kings or queens. Have the prestige, have the power and dominance. Well, the way to the goal that God has set before us is just the opposite of showing off, of being courageous, of being king, of striving for and clinging to power. Rather, it is the way of sacrificing service. The temptation for Jesus and for us to be who we are created to be. So back to the two questions raised at the beginning of this message. Who are you? Who am I? Well, we are beloved children of a loving creator. We are God's precious children who are made in God's own image and likeness. What is your purpose? What is my purpose? Our purpose is by love 
to serve and enjoy God forever, and to love and serve our neighbor as we love ourselves. We will do and accomplish these things by the grace of God to whom we belong and will always belong. Amen, and may God bless us all. Now you're invited to think of any needs, joys, concerns that you might have, and we'll have a moment of silent prayer. Loving God, we celebrate and thank you for your gracious presence in our world and lives on this first Sunday of Lent. During this season of self-examination and of silence, we wait for the leading of your Holy Spirit. Through your Spirit, you guide us through the wilderness where our lives are laid bare, and we come face to face with our desires for power, power over our lives and the lives of others, and maybe even power over you. So open us to your grace and mercy, your love and provision, as we face ourselves and wrestle with our true identity. And during this season of Lent, open us to the new life of your Holy Spirit, a life of faith, hope, and love. Help us discover the goodness and fullness of life in your realm of peace. May we love and help all those that you love and those who need your help the most, the poor, the outcast, victims, the captive, the lonely, the least among us. And we lift and pray for all people who are suffering, grieving, or hurting. We also pray for those countries that continue to experience conflict. We pray for our own country and our leaders. We ask that you give them your wisdom, fill them with your love, 
and help us, the people of this country, to continue loving each other even when we have strong disagreements. And gracious God, may your love and compassion be a part of what helps us to become more faithful disciples of the one who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now sing our closing hymn, Christ whose glory fills the skies. As we travel this Lenten journey, let us go into the world with faith, trusting God to guide us. And let us go into the world with love, love for all people, love that can heal. And may the faithfulness of God, the strength of God's Spirit, and the love of Christ be with us all. Amen. <laughs>